Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. The awe and wonder of the works of artist Anila Qayyum Aga. The latest installment of a Hollywood franchise breaking box office records. And the Rolling Stones leaving their mark on outer space. All these and more on today's show. But first, off to the buttons. The acting award hat of Sarajevo goes to Levan Gilbakiani. <laughs> We'll bring you our own review of the 25th edition of the Sarajevo Film Festival. A monumental way to adorn the planet or just arrogant vandalism. We'll talk to an expert about whether land art is still relevant in the 21st century. The International Theatre Company brings its big magic tent to Istanbul. The zenith of the 25th Sarajevo Film Festival, which has been in full swing in the Bosnian capital for the past week, was reached with the handing out of the Heart of Sarajevo Awards. The biggest awards at this year's fest were handed to Turkey's Emin Alper, who took home the Best Director Prize for A Tale of Three Sisters, while the Bosnian-Dutch co-production Take Me Somewhere Nice scooped Best Feature Film Award. Now, let's turn to Showcase's resident movie guru, Ali Jan Pamir, who was there on location to report from Sarajevo Film Festival this year. Hi, Ali Jan, welcome back to Istanbul. Thank you, it's good to be back. So, we just heard that the uh, Bosnian-Dutch drama won the top honor. Do you think it was a good choice? Because it was a debut film, wasn't it? Definitely. Actually, I think it was one of the favorites already. I mean, it's a Bosnian-Dutch co-production, which is incidentally uh, the Dutch entry for the upcoming Oscars for the foreign film category. And also, not only that, but, you know, Bosnian, when you look at Bosnian cinema, it's a co-production, so it's about the Dutch filmmakers also, but uh, the Bosnian community was also interested. Bosnian films mostly tend to be about, you know, memory, and this movie is about roots, you know, a Bosnian young woman living in the Netherlands, come back to, you know, help his father. And, you know, this kind of thing really clicks with the Bosnian festival public. And it has been championed as one of the favorites, so I don't think it was a surprise at all, actually. But how about the Dutch side of the movie? What mm -hmm. was the Dutch side of the mm -hmm. movie? I mean, the Dutch side of the movie being, you know, the cosmopolitanism of the city that is set in, that the main character lives in, and she sets off to actually visit her father, as I said. So I think from the perspective of two countries, it, is, it will attract, attract attention from not only the both of these respective countries, but also in an international level also. Mm -hmm. And um, A Tale of Three Sisters, Emin Alper, he mm -hmm. got the Best Director Award. Was it surprising it wasn't, right? Because it was sort of a magnet for acclaim this year. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, Alper is already like a veteran of the Sarajevo Film Festival. And uh, his film has been, you know, receiving acclaim, as you said, winning at the Istanbul Film Festival. And not only that, but also he, it was one of the contenders for the Berlinale, for the Golden Bear. And it had faced tough competition. But, you know, they made up for that loss here at Sarajevo, I think. Mm. And um, congratulations on your amazing coverage from Sarajevo. We've been fondly following it. So I know Thank that you've you. been to many panels because mm -hmm. we talked about mm -hmm. it earlier before the show. So tell us about uh, all those activities you attended to apart from film screenings. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the festival actually offers quite a lot of engaging activities for festival goers and also industry players as well. Uh, one of them was this really interesting panel on creative cities and, you know, People from different disciplines got together, musicians, filmmakers, and they were basically talking about how do you make a living space creative? And in the end, it's all about, you know, the multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, texture of a city that it was decided at the panel that, you know, uh, allows for this creativity, bringing in different creative people from different disciplines into the city to let them, you know, do their art, which adds to this, they said, creative. And also... Actually, there was the Bridget, uh, Bridget Lacombe uh, Cinema Portraits exhibition. I got to meet her as well, actually. Wow. And she, great uh, portraits by, you know, that she took uh, over the decades since the 70s. 
and that was really interesting. But the most interesting outlet for me, not only as a movie buff, but as a frustrated filmmaker, was TRT's uh, 12 Punto platform, which is really about uh, people with ideas. They submit their work to it because there was this key, uh, keynote speech. And submission of ideas, they're uh, developed by help of professionals into a feature movie. And it's an internationally, uh, it, it is a platform that allows for international co-production mm -hmm. as well. And from the, the co-production market is quite popular. Uh, it's very famous, isn't it, in definitely, Sarajevo? Definitely, definitely. Mm. And actually, not only it is popular and important, but it turns out, you know, 12 Punto is actually allowing it for, uh, uh, for an international marketing point of view as well. So the idea starts with them, their help, and they even help it market it. Mm -hmm. And TRT mm -hmm. is a festival partner. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean, Alijan? What were they doing there, or what were we doing there? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, not only as a movie buff, but also like as a member of the TRT family, I couldn't have been more proud. Like, you know, since I was 14, I was hoping that TRT would reach this kind of, you know, level as far as movie uh, culture is concerned. At the moment, I think we're one of the most, you know, uh, engaging movie uh, culture promoting company, so to speak. And not only the 12 Punto, but also we're one of the uh, sponsors, as you said, and we're d uh, giving them great support, which I think is really important, and they appreciate it. And also not only that, but like, um, especially TRT World Citizens, uh, short films were also internationally debuting there, which this year's theme was the women of war, which I think is a really important subject, you know, how women are affected by war and conflict. So uh, from the movie screenings, from the platforms that we bring in to help the filmmakers and also to aware, uh, raise awareness on certain topics, I think we're just there and I think that's really important. So. Mm -hmm. and, um Quickly before we wrap up, mm -hmm. um, I happened to cover Sarajevo Film Festival yeah, before yeah. a few years ago for Showcase. And um, my observation was that the festival is so important for the city. It's beyond any comparison to any of the festivals that I've been to. Was that your um, observation as well? Was that your experience too? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things, and actually uh, director uh, Alejandro Inaritu, who was receiving an honorary award there, agrees with you and I, because it's a place, it's a festival where the whole city claims it as their own. So it's not only about the cinephile elite, you know, like people from the, all different walks of life are there. And also uh, it helps the city because that's the peak season for um, tourists. So, you know, it brings the city alive also. In every aspect, the festival is helping Sarajevo and film culture also there. It almost felt like they were waiting for that time of the year when I was there. Alijan? Great to have you on our set, as always. Thank you so much for Thank this. Thank you for having me. Dazzling, spectacular and mind-blowing. The famous Cirque du Soleil is back in Turkey with its extraordinary trapeze shows, magic fire productions and performances that push the boundaries of what humans can do. We sent Adil Halim to find out what audiences can expect from their latest Indian-inspired production. Zef Gonzalez is getting ready for the show, a Cirque du Soleil production, something the young acrobat never could have imagined. I was always uh, afraid of like stages and being like the center of attention growing up. And when I started doing my first shows and started doing Slackline at the parks and people would watch, I realized how much I enjoy like when you finish and a whole group of people are watching and everybody just starts cheering, it's like, okay, wow, you, you really see the change that you make in other people's lives. And I think that's an amazing thing that any artist here will tell you, we live for that moment when the crowd gives you something that you just can't experience anywhere else. This is Cirque's fourth time in Istanbul but the first time the Big Tent show has come to the Asian side of the city. If you haven't been to a Cirque du Soleil show before, expect to see plenty of gravity-defying humans flying through the air, playing with fire, and doing all kinds of crazy tricks on bikes, roller skates, ropes, and pretty much anything they can get their hands and feet on. 
Cirque's been traveling the world for 35 years. Founded in Montreal, the global brand started with just 20 street performers. It's come a long way since then. Cirque now employs 1,400 artists. Well, what you have to know about Cirque du Soleil is that it's a company, of course, of circus, but that doesn't have any animals. Um, so we, it's like just everything, the beauty of the human, so what we can do, what all the acrobat and the artists are able to do. And the music is live, so we have two musicians on site, plus the singer, and everything is live, yeah, it's fun. Bazaar started in India late last year, then made its way through the Gulf states before coming to Turkey. It has been challenging because the format is very new to the region. Um, and also format has specific demands, a large land in the middle of a city. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of things to be done before as opposed to older shows that we could go to a stadium or an arena and that's it, it's easy to operate. Um, but, it's, uh, but it's all worth it because it's a really different product. He says Bazaar's Istanbul run has been in the works for about three years and hopes it will appeal to millennials. The storyline talks about a maestro that wants to pass the torch to the next generation. So the story really relates to the fact, uh, as well as a lot of music, the set design. Everything is very contemporary. Everything is quite 2019, 2020. So I think it's a combination of all elements that really appeals to the next generation to see what live entertainment it is and why they should like it. Yeah, I think that's like the, the aim of our show is you kind of bring you into a world that you never really experienced before, you know, and you change the way that people see things, what's possible and what's not. Nothing much seems impossible after watching the adrenaline-filled show's high-flying, death-defying stunts. Adil Halim, TRT World, Istanbul. Still to come on Showcase. This epic earth. Today, we look at land art. Is it anywhere as relevant as it was half a century ago, or is it just a forgotten chapter in art history books? The magic of shapes, light, and reflections. We take a look at one artist's enchanting installations. And the first teaser is out from Turkey's entry for the best international feature film in the 92nd Academy Awards. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. After receiving just about every earthly honor, the Rolling Stones has now moved on to making history on the Red Planet, as NASA has named a rock on Mars after the band. Actor Robert Downey Jr. announced it the night before the band's concert in a stadium in Pasadena, California. NASA's tribute came after its inside lander touched down on Mars last year, blowing the rock and making it literally a Rolling Stone. Are they bats? The drones, the drones! The third installment of the Fallen film series, Angel Has Fallen, has topped the box office with a $21.3 million debut, nearly matching its predecessor, London Has Fallen, from three years ago. The series stars Gerard Butler as a Secret Service agent, protecting the US president, played by Morgan Freeman. With this edition, the production company Lionsgate had its second number one film of the year after John Wick 3. Award-winning Turkish director and screenwriter Semih Kaplanoğlu's latest film has been selected as Turkey's entry for the best international feature film in the upcoming Academy Awards. The film, called The Bond, chronicles the life of Aslı, a woman has recently given birth to a child and tackles the issues of womanhood in the modern world. The Bond will be released in Turkey on September the 20th and the 92nd Academy Awards will be presented in February.
A new Breaking Bad movie is coming to Netflix nearly six years after more than 10 million Americans tuned in to the legendary show's finale. The film, called El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie, will expand on the story of Jesse Pinkman, the former partner of Walter White. It was written and directed by the show's creator, Vince Gilligan, and will be released on Netflix on October the 11th. In the 1960s, the American art world was getting more and more commercialized. But at the same time, there was a rising trend towards environmentalism across the country. And so the Lend Art movement was born when a group of artists wanted to get people out of museums and back into nature that they twisted, shaped and literally played with. To tell us about how the Lend Art movement is doing today and more, we cross over to art critic Susan Betkenau. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. So I think this term might confuse some people. So tell us what Lend Art is. Is it any kind of art in nature? Yes. Land art, by its very definition, is made out of the cities. It was made in remote terrains. And it's a historical phenomenon. It was 1960s, say, through the 70s. Uh, after that, uh, it's no longer called land art. Uh, it, it, uh, People weren't doing it for a while. Now they're doing something very much more attuned to the environment than they did then. There was a kind of simultaneity, a concurrence between Rachel Carson's 1962 kind of spark of environmentalism, her book Silent Spring, and the onset of land art. However, they're actually discreet. They're actually separate. Land art was not environmentalist. As anyone will tell you uh, who complains about the massive amounts of earth that were upturned or even dynamited by Michael Heiser. Uh, it, land art came out of an art world style called minimalism, which was uh, very rectilinear, very boxy, very uh, reduced in its artistic uh, facture, very simplified, so that the thrust of the ex art experience was thrown onto the viewer to walk through the environment, the interior environments of minimalism, and experience one's own size and weight and girth and, and uh, body. And the earthwork artist took that, expanded it, and made very minimalist forms in deserts. But let me ask you this, is land art anywhere as relevant as it was half a century ago, or do you think it's just a forgotten chapter in artistry books? Well, well, neither. I mean, I don't think it's particularly relevant. I mean, any more than cubism is relevant. I mean, uh, I mean or, or you could say it's an early form of artists working in the environment. But the form they're working in the environment, they wouldn't do that now. Because for two reasons. First of all, no one would fund it. And second of all, it's been done. Well, actually, the third reason, the main reason is because now anyone who has any sense is concerned about climate change. And they're making art, if they make it in nature, to say, reclaim destroyed sites, or clean water, or clean air. Uh, they're making works that have a more uh, environmentalist positive uh, intention, as you'd say. Whereas there, it was very much about cowboy bravado, making, making big works to show how masculine and strong they were. And, uh, and people just, the, the, the ideas of uh, art and of gender have changed. So it's interesting as a historical phenomenon. Now, on the other hand, we could say, why do people still come, still come to still visit the spiral jetty, mm -hmm. which is the picture behind me, the, uh, the Robert Smithson 
gigantic earthwork, which is 1,500 feet long and 15 feet wide, made uh, over a month or so in um, uh, Utah in the Great Salt Lake. It's very famous. It's People it's still go there. It's probably the pivotal work, isn't it? But Suzanne, one more question before we run out yeah, of time uh, uh, about yeah. that and about a lot of land yeah. art. Land art works. Uh, some people call land art like arrogant vandalism. What do you say to them very quickly before we wrap up? I would say yes, it was. I mean, sometimes it was. Michael Heiser, you know, he said he loves to be in that unraped, uh, you know, pure desert, and then he dynamited 240,000 tons. You know, yes, it was. But well, that this was. Is great. We had this a different. Done. Or orient orientation toward nature then than we do now. Suzanne, this is great, very I mean, informative, now we very do this. amazing interview. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. Oh. Thank you so oh. much for your time. Okay, or thank you. Okay. Here's a story that will make you question whether what you're seeing is real. With this next painter, it's hard to tell, as she exchanges traditional canvases in favor of painting on something more unique, and in doing it, puts a whole new spin on the idea of portrait painting. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. You can head to our YouTube channel though for more from the world of art and culture. But before we leave, let's take a look at the beautiful and thought-provoking works of artist Anila Koyum Aga. Her installations deal with light and shadow, not only dazzling audiences with its dreamlike aesthetics, but also challenging them with tough and conceptual questions. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.